Fog maze of summer. And um, Cheryl, are you recording or you want me to press the button? I just pressed the button. We're good to All go. Right. We're live. You didn't even didn't even count you in there. Anyways, um, so we're going to get started today um, with some news um, about California. Cheryl, kick us off. Um, my internet says it's unstable. I hope you all are hearing me okay. Uh, but what happened today is that I sent out a, a notification to everyone in their SAN uh, listserv about a notice that went out from the department yesterday. It's the first guidance we've received about the 2016 regulations. Um, but you will recall that the 2016 regulations were delayed last July, July of 2018, but an August, uh, excuse me, April 26, 2019 court ruling vacated the delay. They stayed the delay for 30 days, which meant that May 26 of 2019, the 2016 federal regulations for state authorization went into effect, which meant that all of those disclosure issues that we talked about went into effect. A definition of state authorization reciprocity agreement went into effect. And then today, specifically, the department addressed a little piece of 600.9C talking about the documentation of a complaint process in the states. And as we have discussed since I think they were proposed regulations three years ago. California at that time did not have a complaint process. I believe it was 2017 when they implemented it for four profits that were out of state. But currently and since then, there has not been a complaint process for out of state institutions that are public or private nonprofit that offer distant ed education to students located in California. So that is an issue. And we were concerned that for the purposes of Title IV um, HEA programs to be able to offer that to students in California, there had to be a documentation of a complaint process and there is not one. And so the department released um, the guidance yesterday um, that this regulation is in fact in effect became effective May 26 as we've been talking about now for a couple months um, and that it does um, confirm that there is not a complaint process in California and so I strongly urge you to have a look at what I'm the uh, announcement that I'm and that I'm talking about because what it specifically indicates and what I indicated in my note today is that under the 2016 regulations that are now in effect students residing in California receiving distance education or correspondence courses from out of state public or nonprofit institutions are not eligible for title 4 um, until such time as the state of California provides those institutions with an appropriate complaint process. So that's where we are at this point. We wondered how this would um, play out. We wondered, we knew that it, it would have an effective day, May 20th, and the effective date. We were still in question because you'll recall that after the uh, ruling came out from the U.S. District Court, we, we wrote about it and we're seeking guidance from the department about what the enforcement would be of these regulations. So the department has been very clear about uh, what this means um, for this regulation, this portion of the regulation, and it also indicated that the department intends to file a motion for clarification or other appropriate pleading to the U.S. District Court to obtain protection for students in California. But it also said that until a new regulation is implemented or the court rules otherwise, this regulation um, applies as written. So, um, you know, we knew that it was going to come into effect May 26, 2019, but how it was going to be um, managed and viewed by the department was still a question mark, and we now know that very clearly. Um, we also know that the department has filed an appeal of the U.S. District Court and will be um, 
is, uh, has an August 23rd date to submit its brief um, about, the court, about its appeal of the court ruling. Um, does anybody have any questions about what, uh, what we stated here? I mean, right now it's a matter of, of just facts. So what the enforcement aspect of it is, we are not aware of that at this moment, but we do know what the department says in terms of it being effective and the effective date absolutely was May 26. Any questions? You can unmute yourself or put it in the group chat if you'd like. Okay, well, I know that Russ was going to join us too. And Dan, I know you're, you're still, you're with us. Uh, do either of you have additional comments you would like to make um, about this? Before I turn it over to you though, I, I do wanna point out that we are writing a blog post at this time um, about these particulars. And we have been in communication with um, Witchy um, about interacting in California um, uh, to determine what we can do to um, support these students. <clears throat> Cheryl, this is Sue Hochberg. I, I actually wrote an, an email to the group this morning. I think probably many of us have the same question, which we may not be able to answer, given what you just said, which is we only know the facts, and that is, what do we do with current students um, in, who are maybe in the midst of completing an online program? And I guess we don't really have the answer to that. Is that right? You, well, you're, you are correct. So what it comes down to at this point is you're going to need to work with legal counsel at your institution and determine what kind of um, of risk is, you know, what's the risk tolerance at your institution for this? Um, you know, and that's not something that, that we can address very specifically to you. It'll have to be the institution making a determination of how it would like to move forward. Uh, Russ, are you on the line right now? Because I know you, were, you and I were talking about this and maybe you could provide more depth to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I've been, uh, been listening to this and that, and and on this, that uh, truly <clears throat> we wish the department would have given more specific uh, guidance on a lot of these things that, that they have here. So really, the, all they really said was that uh, you're, you're out of compliance on this and didn't uh, talk about what they would do in terms of, you know, how are they going to enforce this, if they're going to enforce this, what, what are institutions supposed to do, blah, 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 you know, all sorts of questions uh, going down the path here. And so on... Um, what you'll see in the blog post that we're, we're, we're putting out is uh, exactly what Cheryl said, is that really given what you, what you have, we, want, we think that you need to take all the pieces, put them together, and talk to leadership at your institution, because this is something as a decision, um, no offense to any of you, but you want to make sure that your higher-ups know right. <laughs> and are part of this decision, uh, and, and, and that they're the ones that are making it in terms of deciding what is your tolerance for risk? Because you you know you could lose federal uh, if you're found out of compliance. You could lose federal financial aid for those students who are in states where you're out, out of out of compliance. And so uh, it would be just that. And so you would have to figure that out and then try to figure out well how much do you think they're going to actually look for this? Because this rule, one thing to be very clear, maybe we haven't haven't said, is not part of the new regulations that are coming out next year. Uh, this this requirement to have a complaint process, you know, so how much are they going to want to uh, enforce it in the meantime? So, it, 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 uh, sorry, but we're going to have to, you know, put it back on to you to try to figure out, okay, how much do you want to um, uh, take that risk between now and then, and then, and then working with the, with the students that you have, and then uh, that answer may differ quite a bit by uh, institution with the number of students you have there and your commitment to California and you know whatever factors and just the risk tolerance that you have among your um, uh, attorneys and, uh, and uh, president and, and whomever whoever else and so that's really where we're sending people at this moment there are quite a few that have asked um, in the chat 
about what to do. And I and I and I'm not going to address those very specifically because I think the general uh, response that Russ just gave um, does does answer those. Um, unfortunately, not completely because you don't know exactly what to do to move forward. But it's going to be your institution's decision, as Russ indicated, um, how you choose to move forward. But it's important to be able to know what these facts are. Um, you know, as Russ said, it, they are not part of the new regulations. Um, they are subject to an appeal right now. Um, it, it really is going to be interesting to see how this moves forward. Um, but the department made a decision. It, you know, this is a department that not, doesn't provide a lot of guidance, but they made a decision to offer guidance on this aspect of the federal regulations that had been that had been delayed but are no longer delayed. So I think I find that very interesting that they identified this very specifically. We're we're hoping that there's a larger strategy, but there is some thought that it would be and that you know something else will be coming down the line. But there's also, you know, they have very few staff and and uh, uh, they haven't been noted for their strategy lately. So that maybe there is a strategy on this. So uh, hard to say. And uh, as, as Mary Larson pointed out, and I thank Mary for putting that in there, which he does continue to work in California to encourage um, California to join Sarah, but it will require legislative change. And also, which he is reaching out to California about a complaint process itself. So it's, it's, it's from both angles. So we do have interactions currently um, transpiring to um, try to come to some some help for the institutions and the students right now. Um, so that is, that is in play. The, uh, the other thing uh, that, that goes with this is that, so this also affects our other states that do not have complaint processes for non sara institutions. And so if you're a non sara institution, you need to worry about that. And also the Pacific Islands uh, that uh, not all of them or maybe none of them have a complaint process at this point. Uh, which he has been working with with those islands, and a few of them are you now members of which he our parent organization. Uh, and so I know that they are reaching out to those islands about this issue as well. And and some of these states, uh, when they became SARA states, um, did a really good job of creating a SARA complaint process um, that does not appear to uh, be applicable to in-state. So. Um, that was a concern as we were going through and updating the um, the state complaint processes, you know, that we processes that processes that we um, provide on our website. So we could not find in a handful of states what their state process was separate from, and they do not have to have a separate complaint process for Sarah. Um, they can just have a state process, but they indicated very specifically that it was a Sarah process, which meant that it would not be applicable as a non sara opportunity. So, you know, that's a concern and we've addressed that with a couple of, um, of different states and hope that that can be um, managed soon. So we, uh, as I said, we will be um, sharing more with you as quickly as possible. And uh, there will be a blog post coming out that, that frames this whole um, issue. But one of, the, one of the most important things, as Russ pointed out, is determining at your institution. So you're going to have to work with key stakeholders at your institution to decide how you, as an institution, wish to move forward. And yes, I do want to confirm with everyone that it was May 26 that the regulations went into effect. Yeah, so you would think that they would not be able to enforce that prior to that, uh, uh, prior to that date, or students who were admitted in any courses as of that date. One would, one would, one would think that if you had courses that started after that date, you would think that those would be, uh, those could be problematic. Again, this all would have been really nice if the department would have given us more information about how and if they were going to enforce this. 
And uh, Russ, we have some questions here about uh, returning financial aid already awarded. Um, should we direct them to their financial aid offices to have these discussions? Yes. Yeah. You need to have that. You need to have that discussion there with the financial aid. Well, first, before you go there, again, you know, get the decision about how does your institution want to react? Do they want to wait and see whether anything else is going to come out or do they want to just go be very proactive and go back and clear the decks and all that? <clears throat> so I think that's the first step before you do anything in terms of uh, re returning any aid. And then we did have, um, and we've talked about this before, if the student is not receiving Title IV financial aid in California, um, that this that is one option is that it does, you don't offer financial aid some uh, we had uh, one of our um, colleagues here has asked how does this you know how does this change if the student is not receiving financial aid in California that's located yeah. in California yeah and to the things about federal aid it, it, you know it's all a decision about whether you're trying to return aid or not once that decision is made there are set processes within uh, the financial aid, uh, the financial aid people should know about how that works, or they need to talk to their regional financial aid office about how that how that works. That those would be where the where the answers would be. But the decision about whether to return aid, whether to not give aid, whether to not have students come in, all that, all lies with the institution at this point. And, and of course, you know, we don't know where this is going to go with the appeal and whether they'd even win the appeal. We don't, we don't know that. Um, so these are conversations that need to start happening at your institution straight away. I wouldn't wait on any appeal process or any, um, um, or uh, any submission of, um, of something by the department to um, another pleading you know, to the department, from the department to the U.S. District Court, I wouldn't wait on those things, that having these conversations at your institution is really important, um, which, which actually is really rather interesting, because if you roll into the next item, which was about, um, uh, about being at NACUA, NACUA is the National Association of College and University Attorneys, and um, it was at one of those sessions that Aaron Lacey of Thompson Coburn uh, was talking about the um, regulations that um, Office of General Counsel should be made aware of um, regarding the Department of Ed new rules. And so I brought up the question that since the um, the uh, court ruling that the former federal regulations were in place, and and I asked, you know, how um, how institutions are managing this? How are, how is General Counsel uh, directing? their institutions for uh, their compliance management folks and how to comply with this. And there were crickets in the room. So at the time, general counsel was not talking about this, but I can tell you today that NACU has had uh, several comments in their um, email distribution list, much like our listserv, uh, trying to get their arms around this as well. So I know that the general counsels are now talking about it. And so it, it is going to force a conversation for you all um, with your general counsel uh, to determine what the what the processes are that you want to move through um, to manage compliance under this regulation. Is there a question too about uh, uh, from Kate Marshall, if the institution students in California do not receive financial aid, uh, does this change the obligation? The, all of this is about federal financial aid. So if you're enrolling students who do not receive federal financial aid, then you just go by whatever the rules are of that state, which is California in this, this case, and, and they're not they're not overseeing you at all. So I appreciate these questions very much. Uh, um, these in general, like I said, we cannot we're not in a position to be able to give you direct suggestion of what you should do at your institution um, about this. But it does it is particularly about Title IV financial aid and what is required for compliance for Title IV. OK, so that that is what this is directly about and how you manage compliance at your institution is going to have to be a conversation uh, within your institution. But we'll send out more. Um, 
about the particulars of this and, and what will help frame your conversation in a blog post that you'll probably receive um, either later today or early tomorrow. Russ, is there anything else we should address at this point with that? Or Dan, do you have any additional comments at this point? Um, no, except that it's frustrating for me in some ways to see the questions here because they're very good questions. They're very specific questions. And um, it's just, I, I wish we could be, a, I, I guess I just really empathize with you all sitting in the chairs you're sitting in and, and um, I, you know, obviously I wish that the department had provided more guidance or that we could give these very specific answers. Um, all we can do is just state, you know, what the, the very restate really the very short um, guidance from the department and, and it was, you know, obviously already effective. Um, but these things in the details, um, unfortunately there's, I don't know, I just, I just, uh, want to express empathy for you all who have to actually then go in and apply this. I agree with that, Dan. I yeah. need to go back yeah. and take financial aid or stop the servings Californians. There, there's no, there's no easy answer to any of this. So anyway, I have no, nothing really to add, but I just, I'm with you guys. I agree with that, Dan. And then maybe once you move on with the agenda, then if people still have other questions that they could um, uh, put that out there, do you see that uh, this, Anyway, I'll add through this one here is people know how many students that this uh, has an impact on. Uh, and I'm doing my calculations looking at the SARA data that I'm thinking it's well over 50,000 students just in California alone uh, who are in California and are enrolled in, from institutions from outside the state. That's just a guess based upon the SARA, SARA data. Right. And, and just to, and just to, to add to that, um, we shared that with the department. So they are aware of, you know, we pointed to um, our concerns about the tens of thousands of students that would be affected by this, um, by this implementation of this regulation. So um, they're aware of that as well. So, um, and yes, Dan, thank you very much for stating that about our empathy for these questions. Um, to be able to respond to these questions. And, uh, I, I, but I think what is really important for you all to take away is that we will provide some more framing for the conversation at your institution. And please know that WICHE, um, that we are in conversation with WICHE about um, collaborating with, uh, with California to get a response to this. So there is movement in that regard. It's just, we don't have that kind of thing to state to you today about where it's gonna go. So Dan, do you want me to go on with NACUA a bit? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, just to share with you all a little bit about NACUA, as I mentioned, I, I went to an excellent session about that. I was really appreciative of the opportunity to be um, at this conference. It was with 1,800 other attorneys. I've never been in a place with 1,800, 1800 attorneys. Um, what they provide there, uh, in addition to um, their PowerPoints, is they, they write a lot of write, white papers um, that uh, are about their um, session. So it gives a lot of good information and background about the variety of um, subject areas that they cover. Um, my big takeaways uh, that I came out with, um, I have already talked to you about the regulations. Um, and another was that there seems to be at institutions a real concern right now about being able to manage regulatory management because there are so many regulations that general counsel's offices are often very overwhelmed in addition to managing all of the other legal aspects that they manage at an institution. So that many institutions are implementing an office of, um, for compliance, a compliance office, compliance manager. Some of them are JD, some are not, some report to legal counsel, some report direct to the president, but what they're seeing is that there needs to be an additional um, person who's being able to oversee um, where they are with regulatory matters. Um, and so I, I found that very interesting in what the interaction is. Much like our state authorization compliance staff, 
we're seeing a real varied approach to this, and I'm sure that's something that they're going to be testing at institutions to define the right formula, much like we're seeing um, with our institutions managing the right formula to uh, handle to handle all of the compliance aspects for state authorization. The other thing uh, that was my, my last big takeaway is that I have an appreciation that we have um, the ability to reach out to experts to support our work here with SAN um, and help uh, you all. I was able to have um, wonderful conversations and, and got enormous amount of, res of response and support uh, for our organizations, our institutions that are part of their organizations from three different law firms. Uh, Cooley LLP, Michael Goldstein um, from Hogan Lovells with Greg Fahrenbach and Thompson Coburn with Aaron Lacey. I was able to have very good interactions with them and they're very supportive of our work um, and uh, willingness uh, to provide direction when we reach out for it. So I just wanted you to know we have good support. Um, and I, I think we probably uh, want to move on to the rest of the agenda, but if anybody has any questions about NACUA, um, you know, feel free, obviously, to be in touch. Yes, I thought it was funny. Somebody in the comment indicated 1800s attorneys. Yes, 1800 attorneys. I made jokes myself. So, yes, it was very funny. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, move back to Dan and let him proceed with the agenda. Well, sure. One, one follow-up there. Did, did you come away with any... Um, advice for for our members sitting in the compliance offices to try to find ways to educate um, the university councils about some of these issues? That is very interesting that you asked that question because there was a gentleman from a university in Illinois that um, I had this conversation as I was walking out um, from the session with Aaron Lacey and was indicating that some of our um, compliance uh, folks um, had some concerns about reaching out to legal counsel at their institution and he was kind of surprised by that and uh, you know this is one person's opinion but he specifically said well I hope that's never the case that they you know um, would like to see at his institution and I hope there are many that feel this way I know when I worked at an institution my former institution was this way as well that reaching out to the compliance is the compliance folks reaching out to legal counsel with a prepared plan or a prepared um, conversation was always welcome. And so I hope that our compliance staff will um, make preparations to have good conversations with legal counsel. Okay, great. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, all of you diehard fans out, the, out there of this coordinator call, remember that last month we got a great introduction to what the regional compacts, what the role the regional complex play in state authorization. Um, we had our started in our Western tour with Christina Sedney. Now we're heading south to hear from Wanda Barker. She's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the SREB procedures for institutional actions and appeals, and then a little bit about some initiatives that the SREB is doing on disaster preparedness. And I mean, in this case, natural disasters, not regulatory disasters, I don't think anyway. So <laughs> Wanda, go ahead. That's a great segue, Dan. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. It's a, a pleasure to, to do this for you. Um, so I'm sure everyone understands on the call that in order for an institution to participate, they have to be in a state that is a SARA member. And for the state to be approved, it has to participate in one of the four regional compacts. Um, SREB's region is made up of 16 state members as well as four affiliated states, districts, or territories um, that affiliate with us just for purposes of SARA, and that includes Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. Um, our regional steering committee is made up of about 20 representatives from each of the state portal entities in our region, as well as five at-large members. Um, now, the regional steering committees are made up of different components in each region, but for us, they're primary the, port, the portal entity members plus the five at large. But basically, they review the performance of the state portal entities um, in the two years since their last renewal 
or since their initial application. Um, the Regional Compact SARA staff works with the states on SARA policies, questions, supporting what they do, um, you know, any way that we can. And we also work collaboratively with the other regional compacts to help ensure consistent policies and practices across the regions. We uh, also conduct webinars and presentations and hold um, meetings and events and attend other SARA meetings and events. Um, so down to the two topics we're going to cover, the procedures for appeals. So you may have noticed in the last SARA manual version 19.2 that came out that there are some deadlines in there for procedures um, that the compacts or states need to address. So the SREB regional compact has been working on these procedures since last year and um, we had a, a steering committee uh, subgroup that uh, worked on the procedures. We have a rough draft and it's going through our editorial review. Uh, we hope that it will be finished like within the next week or so and we'll go through our SREB executive board. Uh, but when those are finalized, they'll be put on our website. Um, but the required procedures from the SARA manual have a couple of different deadlines. Uh, the regional compact procedures have to be implemented by July 1, 2020 and the state procedures have a deadline of January 1, 2021. So we'll start with, you know, what those appeals are. One of the first ones is the state denial. So either the initial or renewal denial um, where the state wants to appeal to the regional compact. So by July 1, 2020, the regional compacts have to develop and implement a means to hear and resolve appeals from states for which it denies initial membership or renewal membership. And during an appeal, if a state um, you know, is, is concerned, the, the, state, the status of the state remains unchanged. A second type of appeal is if an institution appeals to the states for an initial denial. So by January 1, 2021, SARA member states have to develop and implement a means to hear and internally resolve appeals from institutions for which they deny initial participation or renewal of participation in SARA. And during any such appeal period, the institution's status does not change. A third type of appeal is if an institution appeals to states in an interim denial. So an institution can be removed at any time, not necessarily during that renewal process, uh, but then they can appeal to the home state or the regional compact. So by January 1, 2021, states need to develop and implement an in-state appeal process for institutions removed by its home state for violation of or non-compliance with SARA policies. The institutional appeal to the regional compact is about an agreed institution and they have the option of asking a regional compact through the compact's normal uh, processes or procedures to determine whether the institution's home state continues to meet the requirements of SARA, but the regional compact cannot direct a state to make a different determination regarding specific case. Um, and of course, if regional compacts don't have those plans, they have to develop it and implement it by July 1, 2020. So I'll pause right there to see if we have any questions and then talk about uh, disaster preparedness or catastrophic events. I don't, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So, um, you know, SARA isn't the only group that requires plans for catastrophic events. Accreditors require them, the federal government and some state laws require them. Obviously, there are different types of events that be, can be considered catastrophic from an institutional closure where they're, you know, ceasing operations completely whether it's related to finances or losses of accreditation. There's institutional closures that are due to natural disasters, such as a flood, tornado, hurricane, or earthquake. Or there can be a temporary disruption of online services like a cyber attack, and you know, maybe all of their systems are down. But the um, SARA manual, the latest version, 19.2, section 2.5H, um, talks about 
what is required. So it requires states to have a well-documented policies and practices for catastrophic events. The state um, may request assistance from the institution's accreditor as the accreditor applies its standards for section 602.24c of the federal requirements for catastrophic events. Um, the state has laws, regulations, policies, or processes in place to deal with the unanticipated closure of an institution and will make every reasonable effort to assure that students receive the services for which they've paid or reasonable financial compensation for those that they did not receive, obviously, if they did not receive their education. So those laws, regulations, and policies or processes um, may include tuition assurance funds or surety bonds or teach out provisions or other practices that are sufficient to protect the consumer, the student. The state requires institutions to have adequate disaster recovery plans, particularly with respect to the protection of student records, or the state provides such a plan. And in some cases in the SREB region, we have states that have an overall plan for providing those records indefinitely at the state level, not at the institution level. And then lastly, a SARA member state agrees to apply its policies and practices for catastrophic events consistently and equally within each sector, meaning public, private, nonprofit, and private for-profit to the residents of any state. Also, uh, I'll mention that, you know, that section was about the manual, but on the SARA applications, the institutions agree um, that if they cannot fully deliver the instruction the student has paid for, they will provide a reasonable alternative to delivering the instruction or provide reasonable compensation for the education that the student did not receive. And that's item number 11 on the renewal applications. So I just want to emphasize that knowing which institutions offer the same degree programs and having agreements for teach out plans can really help institutions be prepared for this type of event. It is up to the state portal entities to work with uh, any struggling institutions in their state that may need some help with this. And I think that it's gonna be very helpful once we have the NC SARA uh, program database launched and I, believe if Mary's on she can tell us I was thinking it was maybe late August but I think this might actually help institutions find options for other institutions that have the same degree programs and uh, be able to negotiate some uh, teach out arrangements within uh, those SARA institutions uh, but a recent figure that I saw um, now, I can't remember if it was through Education Week or the Chronicle, but it said that almost 1,100 institutions have closed between 2014 and 2018. So it is a serious problem, and we've had uh, just thousands and thousands of students affected by those closures. So that's all I had, Dan. I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Wanda. We're, we're, I was thinking about that, too, for an upcoming something, whether that be a call or a blog post or a, or a um, open forum on the issue of closures, because we, we've been hearing so much about that. Yes, um, hot topic, definitely. Yes, <laughs> um, but does any, I'm not seeing any other questions on this, but thank you so much for this. Oh, it looks like Mary's chimed in. Um, August, it does seem to be a hopeful date, um, right. but, um, but anyway, so thank you so much for this information and uh, we will continue our, our march around the country, hopefully hopefully next month. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on here, the SAN Advisory Group, almost a year old, is already in the need of a new member. We had a, there was a member who accepted a new position outside of compliance, so as uh, vacated her, her, her chair. So we have Tyson Heath who is still on the committee on the group. He's going to talk a little bit about um, the election process, a little bit more about what they do, and to really try to encourage people to nominate themselves and, and run. So Tyson, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. And I know that you are a big fan of 
you know, state holidays, national holidays. So uh, here in Utah, we are gearing up tomorrow for Pioneer Day, uh, which is um, to the locals, to me, it's, um, well, it's bigger than, you know, the fourth here with the fireworks and everything. So uh, for all of my fellow Utahns on the call, happy Pioneer Day. But uh, thanks, for, that, thanks for coming on, Tyson. I'm sure you're doing a lot of prep for that. So you're <laughs> really surprised you even came into work today. Well, exactly. Um, <laughs> but no, so uh, yeah, Heather from the University of uh, New Mexico uh, resigned uh, her position with the taking of a uh, new role within her institution, um, has left us with one open vacancy, um, and it will be a two-year term within the advisory group. Uh, like Dan said, we are um, just making it to our first year uh, as a group. The group came about as the 2018, um, the 2018 uh, SAN uh, commitment disclosure, I can't think of the word, but um, it was something that uh, had been identified by the members. But uh, what we do as a committee, we meet at least quarterly, and then we have some asynchronous collaboration between the meetings. Um, some of the discussion points that we've talked about as a group that have come to fruition uh, were the special project groups. Uh, we also, um, so helping to oversee the selection of candidates, uh, reviewing the information, kind of writing the charter for uh, what the expectations of the outcomes from those groups were. Uh, we uh, looked through after the uh, leading up to and after the SAN basic workshop that uh, we refined the assessment. All of us participated within it. I gave our feedback. Um, we helped to create the SAN member survey that Cheryl's going to talk about here in just a minute. Uh, so we're used as a sounding board for Cheryl and Dan as well as um, you know providing some ideas outside of the meetings of what we think might be of value uh, to the general members in the coming year. So uh, with that, uh, we encourage uh, you to nominate yourself or to uh, nominate a colleague uh, if that person consents to it. Um, you will email your information in to Dan and um, just write a short paragraph or two explaining why either you as a nominee or the individual that you nominate would be an asset to the group and how the nominee would represent fellow SAN members. Uh, the deadline for nominations are uh, 5 p.m. Alaska time. That's tricky, Dan. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, Eastern time, I think 10. And then shortly after that, the ballot will be sent to the members on the listserv and we would like to have the new member join our group by September 3rd, and that way we can uh, begin SAN year nine, I believe we're in, uh, with a full committee. So Dan will be sending all of this out in an email as well, so you have all of that information. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great, um, it's been a great group to work with, um, and uh, be able to provide some feedback. A uh, couple of questions that I see that are coming in. So Deb, are there travel requirements for this position? Um, we try to meet at uh, the annual gatherings. So um, this past year at uh, NASAPS, all four of us were in attendance. So uh, we went to dinner as a group and then uh, we tried to get together at the WCET annual meeting and SAM coordinator uh, day as well. Okay, some dead air there. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Cheryl. I just wanted to add that um, the information, you can find it on the um, the SAN uh, About page. If you look up at the, at the home page of the website, you'll see About SAN. You can find it there. Dan also will be sending out an email 
um, to the listserv. You do not have to be a coordinator. Um, we do try to focus on NAS apps um, as a place to get together. Uh, if we can, it's not a requirement, but if we can get together, NAS apps would be an ideal place because um, you do not have to be a coordinator to be on the advisory board. Um, but if you have any questions, certainly contact either Dan or myself, but you can find that on the website. Dan also pointed directly to the resources page, but you can find it starting from the About SAN website page, um, you know, from the homepage of the, of the SAN website. But I hope you will consider, and I, and I hope if you're not considering for yourself, if you'll talk to some people within your institution, they do not need to be a coordinator um, to be on the advisory group. So I, I do want to stress that, and we do want to stress that we're happy with all sectors participating. So we look forward to a new member uh, to join the group. And I'd say, too, another, another thing is, um, in addition to the all sectors, you know, you have to, um, you don't have to be a coordinator, and, and you don't necessarily have to be from, from an institution that um, has totally nailed state authorization. Um, you, got, you need to have an interest and some knowledge, but you don't necessarily have to be, uh, you could be from, from, a, from a school that's, that's struggling with certain aspects of it or a little earlier on in your journey. Um, it's really not meant to be a, a, a council of, 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 the, of the, uh, the all-star schools. It's, it's more just, um, we, it's really a representative group as much as we can in, in, many, in many different ways um, from the institutions. And in fact, you know, we have a member who's not even um, at an institution who's a state portal, um, Terrence Scarborough. So um, we really do uh, encourage anybody to, uh, to give it a whirl if you've got some ideas about, about how this network can improve. That's great. So uh, thanks very much, Tyson, for being uh, willing to talk about it and uh, from your experience, especially um, for our advisory group. We find it to be very helpful um, to get the perspective from the variety of institutions that are represented on the advisory group. And so they are also um, folks you can reach out to um, to share your ideas as well, as well as reaching out to Dan and myself. Um, Tyson mentioned the SAN member survey, and I'll just talk very briefly about that. The SAN member survey is something that we opened a few weeks ago, and uh, it was something the advisory group had indicated was, was a good idea for us to do. We haven't done one in about two years, um, because we wanted to know what resources you all found valuable, what uh, services and benefits do you all find valuable and what other things would be helpful um, to help your compliance management role at your institution. So uh, please, uh, that's hyperlinked in the um, SAN agenda. Uh, we will keep this, the survey open until uh, Friday the 2nd. So please have a look at the survey, encourage others at your institution, you know, you all are the coordinator, so we hope that you are helping to be leaders in your membership um, to encourage others to participate um, in activities, even if they're not coordinators. Um, so their input would be valuable as well for the survey. So um, I hope you will consider that because uh, we do like to hear your input um, to help us frame what we'll be doing for the, for the upcoming months and years. Dan, do you want to add anything about the SAN member survey? Um, no, not really. Um, it doesn't take it doesn't take very long, um, so that's always a plus. It it is a very quick survey. That's that's true. Dan and Tyson um, had input on that, and I really appreciate the work that they did to to open that up. So that's really helpful. And just while I while I'm I'm speaking before I turn it over to Dan, um, the um, one of the things I wanted to share is that we have been uh, moving forward on all of the new registration or the renewal registration for uh, this year. And I thank everybody for their, um, for their participation. I know many, most have already supplied their payment and I thank you for that. If you haven't had the opportunity, would appreciate you checking for the invoice and processing the invoice. A few have contacted us to say that um, they are in process. We thank them for that. And uh, so just, just to let you know, we are receiving those and thank you very much for um, trying to move promptly on the uh, payment of the invoices. Appreciate that very much. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. So speaking on more on network, network matters. 
so often a new coordinator will come aboard or it could even just be a new contact, someone new to the membership in some way who's new to state authorization. And they'll, they'll ask us, well, what can I do to, to get started just to, just to get up to speed quickly so I can start participating and learn more? And um, we don't have a great answer to that right now. We, we point them to the website, which we're proud of and we work hard on. But we've been talking about ways of providing a, a, a more engaging introduction to our materials. Um, and so we're, we're, we're even thinking about using um, some principles of gamification to do that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I'm, I'm a gamification, um, I'm, I'm a little bit of gamification skept, skeptic, but I'm also curious and um, kind of a novice at it. So I don't, don't wanna, I wanna withhold judgment. Um, but I think that there, there'll be some ways of, we're working on some ways to try to make, uh, get a real engaging introduction to our materials. Um, so as part of that planning process, I'm looking for your help to, and that's, uh, that was on the Google Doc that was linked out on the, on the um, agenda. A couple of things. One is when you first came into your, into your state authorization role, into your SAN interaction with SAN, what were the resources that helped you um, whether they were sand materials or something you found elsewhere, who wouldn't mind uh, pasting those in or saying anything about that. This can be as anonymous as you'd like it to be. The other is we're going to try to come up with some kind of case studies or scenarios to help, again, try to bring this material alive more quickly for somebody. Um, and so if you'd be willing to put in with, with as many of the uh, pertinent with as many of the identifying details obscured if, if you're more comfortable with that but just some scenarios that you came across some problems that you had to solve we've 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 been thinking that one way to really engage people is to put that to, rather than a passive browsing of information where to give them a lens of you're trying to solve a problem or this happened at an institution we don't want it to happen again here's what happened and so um, obviously we can come up with these ourselves, but the, the more authentic they are, the more on point they are from you guys, the better. So if you can take some time and write those in, and if, and if the Google Doc isn't the format you're comfortable with, um, and you can reach out to me directly, of course. Um, so these are just a, just a request of, again, a new project that we're working on. So I see a question here, where's the Google Doc? It's linked right there in the agenda, but I can also pop it right in here to the, to the notes. I will do that. And um, are there any, any questions about that? So anyway, there's not a, there's not a, um, I don't know if we have a hard deadline on this, but this is a project that we're working on. And um, you know, if, if it works for new people, then we can try to find a way to have it work for, for the more veterans out there. Um, it's, just a, it's just another way of engaging with our content. It's one thing that we're always trying to make get better. We put a lot of stuff out, put a lot of stuff on our website, a lot of stuff on the Frontiers blog, um, but we're not always sure that that's getting the engagement that, that we think will be most helpful. So this is just a new, a new frontier for us. We're trying. Speaking of new things, we are trying a summer podcast series, and we recorded our first one with Russ. I hope you had a chance to, to read that, uh, excuse me, listen to that and enjoy it. Um, we have a new one coming, we're recording tomorrow with Megan Raymond from WCET. It's going to be a wide-ranging conversation, and she's an interesting person. So if you ever wanted to, to find more about WCET and how it works and how membership organizations work and how, how SAN and WCET interact well with each other, as well as some questions about annual meeting. We will be covering all of that. I've got more questions for Cheryl about musicals and um, we might even have a regulation of the month. So this is gonna be a great podcast, but, but I do have a, um, a um, request for questions for Megan, if you, if you have any. Um, we did use some questions last time for our, our conversation with Russ, so I really appreciate that. Otherwise, there's events below. There's no open forum in August. We are traveling, um, and in September, we'll be talking about accreditation in some way, shape, or form. And again, just to encourage you to please um, register for the annual meeting, and I won't ask Cheryl about Newsies or Toy Story 4, even though I don't. Anyway, okay. Um, 
Are there any questions for me or Cheryl at this time? I think somebody was asking about the WCET annual meeting, and uh, yeah, let me explain a little bit about that. Those of you that might be new as coordinators may not even uh, be aware of what we try to do at the annual meeting, but every year, the WCET annual meeting, um, we hold a coordinator meeting, meaning that separate from the annual meeting, um, we will have a day, it'll be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the Monday before the annual meeting starts. So um, you could register only for the SAN meeting should you be interested, but I would urge you to participate in the WCET annual meeting, of course, which we'll address tomorrow with Megan. But if uh, there are those of you that can only attend the SAN meeting, you do not have to register for the WCET annual meeting in addition to the SAN meeting. You can go on the site and register just for the SAN meeting. There is no cost for the SAN meeting. It will include lunch and we will go to um, a local establishment uh, after the coordinator meeting to have a networking time um, that'll be heavy hors d'oeuvres um, at a local restaurant and look forward to that very much. Um, there is uh, a code, it's, it depends, all one word, all caps, um, that will, it, that indicates that you're a uh, SAN coordinator, that you've entered that code. Uh, so we hope that uh, you will consider coming. It's in Denver. Um, we have it every other year in Denver. And uh, I, I think that you will find it very beneficial. Somebody asked, is the agenda available at this time for the coordinator meeting? No, we have not developed fully the agenda, but I can tell you generally speaking uh, what we're doing. We will have um, an update on uh, where our membership is. So this is an opportunity for kind of us to give the state of the membership address. Uh, plus we will talk about where the federal regulations are at that time, because if the department provides final regulations by November, Number one, they will be um, able to be uh, effective by July 1, 2020. So this, so the annual meeting will occur after November 1. So it's going to be very interesting to see where we are at that point. So we will address that. We will have uh, several of our members providing presentations about various aspects that are pertinent to our work. And so each year we're able to um, have uh, different volunteers uh, provide those aspects. And then of course, one of the things that we're most proud of is that will be when the Sensational Awards are um, provided to the winners. So we look forward to that because that's a very special time when um, we can showcase uh, the good work of our SAN members. So that's, that's generally the rundown of that 10 to four meeting, but it's a, a very good time for interaction with the other coordinators. Any other questions? And uh, you know, as Dan has put out questions for, for Megan, yeah, it would be really helpful um, to have what your questions are about WCET in general and, and the benefits of the annual meeting. And we can talk a little bit about the SAN um, portion, you know, while we're on um, while we're on that podcast. And you can also find on the WCET website um, a tentative agenda for the, for the WCET annual meeting. The SAN coordinator meeting is the Monday. I don't have a calendar. Uh, I can pull up a calendar. Um, but whatever that Monday is, that would be Monday the 4th because the WCET annual meeting will start on the 5th. So Monday the 4th is the SAN coordinator meeting. And the annual meeting for WCET starts the 5th. We are all day on the 4th. And we will have, you know, like I said, uh, heavy hors d'oeuvres um, afterwards um, as a SAN networking event. That we, we packed a lot in there, Dan. Thanks very much for, for uh, steering us today. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. Um, all right, well, thanks everybody. And um, we look forward to talking to you next month or anytime in between. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to be in touch. Talk to you soon.